For our sixth transformation, we turn to Arethusa. Arethusa was a nymph favored by Diana. One day, while bathing in a stream, Arethusa came to the attention of Alpheus, the river god. With Diana's help, she fled under the ocean to the Isle of Ortigia in the harbor of Syracuse, where Diana changed her into a fountain. It, yet Alpheus was not wanton, and he followed her, changing himself into a river to be united with Arethusa. And legend holds that the waters of the Alpheus River in Greece mingle underground with Arethusa's and emerge in the Arethusa Fountain. Arethusa describes the perfectly still stream in which she skinny-dipped, so clear you could count all the stones, and thus drawing Alpheus' attentions. Once I remember in the summer's heat, tired with the chase, I sought a cool retreat. In venio sine vertice aquas sine murmure untes, perspicuas ad humum, per quas numerabilis alte, calculus omnis erat, quas tuvix ire putares. Arethusa's tale is one of continuity and connections. Continuity from the heavens to the waters under the earth. Connections direct from Greece to Italy, but also connections from the many to the one. The elephant in the room, or elephant on the table, is shorthand for an issue that everyone knows but wishes to ignore, despite its significance. The elephant in the sustainability room is population. Today's world population is estimated at over 6.7 billion people. It took millennia to reach 1 billion people in 1800, 123 more years to double to 2 billion, 33 years to get to 3 billion in 1960, and we've been adding about a billion people in just over every dozen years since 1960. We've spent most of the past two millennia growing by spreading across the planet. Now we grow in place made possible by medical advances and the Green Revolution. The UN provided a disaster scenario for population growth, 36 billion people in 2300. In 1974, T.J. Bass published a book, God Whale, yet another science fiction story about a distant future Earth. The seas have died, a lone biomechanical harvester, half whale, half robot, roams the seas alone. Back on land, the population hits 3.5 trillion, only two orders of magnitude above the 36 billion in the UN's 2300 disaster scenario. 50,000 people per square mile, or 235 people per hectare, a planet covered with every area the size of a football pitch containing over 100 people. In comparison, London's overall population density today it's just under 50 people per hectare. But Mumbai already exceeds the God Whale scenario with just under 300 per hectare. Civilized Seoul is halfway there with 167 per hectare. The 3.5 trillion were living, but as you'd expect, not as we know it. Recycling their waste and body parts, eating processed goo, living in cramped quarters under a brutal dictatorship. Battery people. We don't want that, but people have gotten used to a lot of things. One scary simplifying for equation for change is IPAT, I-P-A-T, originating in a 1970s debate among the ecologists Paul Ehrlich, John Holdren, and Barry Commoner. The terms of the IPAT equation are frighteningly direct. I is the environmental impact, P is the population, A is the affluence or consumption, and T the technology. As population and affluence grow, the environment will increasingly degrade. Technology can be both a force that increases impact or may reduce impact. The math is harsh. Live few or live dirty. Impact equals population times affluence times technology. Someone once asked, what would Jesus have paid for environmental sustainability? Well, at the time of Jesus, there were only 170 million people on the entire planet. So in comparison to today's prices, not a lot. The, the exponential growth imperative of a single species, go forth and multiply, meets the boundaries of our biosystem in a huge clash. 
a bunch of naked apes in Northern Europe and North America have spent the past 500 years increasing affluence because they haven't had to pay the environmental costs of doing so. With today's hot topic being carbon emissions from fossil fuels that clouds numerous other externalities, such as mineral extraction limits, overfishing, biodiversity losses, or even noise pollution. Our challenge is to move from Alpheus's lustful thoughts of mingling waters to the purity of Arethusa's fountain before we flood the earth with ourselves. Ceres, happy again to have her daughter, returned to Arethusa, curious to learn why she ran from home and just how she became a sacred fountain. Arethusa said, I could hear the river god, Alpheus, blindly casting about. Twice he almost trod on me where I crouched under deep weeds. Arethusa, he kept shouting, Arethusa, as if I would answer. You can imagine what I was feeling. What the lamb feels when the wolf's jaws are ripping at the edge of the shed door. Or what the hare feels peering through the wall of grass blades when the circling hounds lift their noses. But Alpheus persisted. Circling the clump of mist, he could see clearly my track that had gone in had not come out. When I understood this, a sudden sweat chilled my whole body. It streamed from me. It welled from my hair. It puddled under my feet. In the time it takes to tell you this, I had become a spring, a brisk stream, a river, flowing away down the hillside. But the river god recognized me, and he too dissolved his human shape. He poured himself into his true nature and mingled his current with my current. <clears throat> 